From the front porch of his home in Marion, Ohio, Warren G. Harding campaigned for the presidency with his slogan, Back to Normalcy After the War. Harding was elected over James M. Cox of Ohio. He entered the White House with the avowed program of putting the United States back on a peacetime basis. Here is President Harding with Mrs. Harding and their famous Airedale, Laddie Boy. From the battlefields of France came the unknown soldier to become a national symbol. Solemnly, an impressive parade of military and naval leaders followed his casket. This included the war president, Woodrow Wilson, and Mrs. Wilson. In the amphitheater of Arlington Cemetery, the ceremonies were held. President Harding delivered the obstacle. He placed the Congressional Medal on the casket. From Marshal Foch of France came the Croix de Guerre. As America in awe looked on, and to his last resting place, the unknown soldier was born. After two crowded years in the White House, President Harding visited America's northernmost possession, Alaska. The president fraternized with the native Alaskans. Indians welcomed the big white chief. On his return, the president died in San Francisco. And not long afterwards, Mrs. Harding joined him in death. Their graves in Marion, Ohio. In 1923, the little Puritan town of Plymouth, Vermont, stirred with great news. Vice President Calvin Coolidge was in this house, and by the light of an oil lamp in this room, John Coolidge swore in his son Calvin as President of the United States. Calvin Coolidge had been Governor of Massachusetts in turbulent years, a Massachusetts State House. A police strike that paralyzed public safety in Boston brought Governor Coolidge to the front as a national figure when he ousted the strikers. He enrolled hundreds of new police and firemen to protect the public. Governor Coolidge inspecting the recruits, swearing them into office, greeting the police chief, a comparatively carefree Coolidge. Then death brought him to Washington, where Chief Justice Taft formally administered the presidential oath for his second term. William Jennings Bryan, thrice candidate for president, on his last appearance in Washington. The nation was suddenly thrilled by the greatest individual feat of generations. Paris crowds rushing to greet Lindbergh at the Bourget Airport. Ecstatic mobs stormed the American Embassy in Paris to honor With Ambassador Herrick, Lindbergh responded to the old world's acclaim. Viking of the air beside the spirit of St. Louis, with which he conquered the blue tomb of the sky. Lindbergh, the first man to fly the Atlantic alone. The world thundered applause for Lindbergh's spectacular flight. Here he leaves the American embassy in Paris to return to his homeland. The government sent the cruiser Memphis to bring Lindy back home. Lone Eagle views again his own country. Statue of Liberty leads the welcoming parade. And New York Harbor sends out an ecstatic salute to the nation's hero. While Broadway turns out teeming thousands to give the greatest ovation in its history for the greatest feat it ever knew. Lindbergh and Mayor James J. Walker, here Blase, New York, go wild with delight. Lindbergh debarking at Washington with his mother and Secretary of the Navy, Adams. 
Washington crowds emulated those of Paris and of New York in roaring welcome to Lindy. Before the Washington Monument, this young man who symbolized America's heroism in peace came for his reward. As head of the nation, President Coolidge lauded Lindbergh and bestowed on him the highest aviation honor in the nation's gift the Distinguished Flying Cross. To outlaw war, Secretary of State Frank Kellogg went to France. The nation's delegates meet to make the anti-war pact. Aristide Briand, former Premier of France, pleads for the anti-war pact which 19 nations signed. Here is the document. Work accomplished, Secretary Kellogg leaves the Hall of Meeting to take the pact back to America. With Mrs. Kellogg, he returns to American soil. To report to his chief at the White House. There before his cabinet, President Coolidge signed for the United States. Treaty designed to outlaw war. Coolidge did not choose to run. Hoover did from Palo Alto. Elon Stanford University, California, from Hoover's home. Stanford students celebrated Herbert Hoover's nomination for the presidency with red fire and friendly riot. Mr. and Mrs. Herbert Hoover at home. From the sidewalks of New York came Al Smith, and New York acclaimed Al and his Brown Derby when he was nominated for the president. With Mayor Jimmy Walker, Governor Smith rode triumphantly through his boyhood street. <laughs> President-elect Hoover's grandchild leads the family in news of his election. Chief Justice Taft swearing in Herbert Hoover as President of the United States. Chief Justice William Howard Taft, former President, resigned his high office to be replaced by a former Supreme Court Justice, Charles Evans Hughes of New York. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, the oldest jurist. The Supreme Court of the United States during the administration of Herbert Hoover. The court that was to decide many vital issues. And here is the most ambitious achievement of the Hoover administration. The gigantic Boulder Dam, designed with its blasting of mountains and taming of rivers to irrigate 235 million acres and banish forever the scourge of drought. Roosevelt broke all presidents by flying to accept the presidential nomination in Chicago. We have a perfect day for this trip, and I'm very happy to be going out to Chicago, and everybody knows the reason why I'm so happy. Convention wants repeal. Your candidate wants repeal. And I am confident that the United States of America wants repeal. That admirable document, the platform which you have adopted, is clear. I accept it 100%. <laughs> 